Okay, so it's 2.30, so let us start. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I am sure, uh, uh, so I will be giving a four lectures in the summer school and refresher course. And the topic of the lecture is quantum clocks for fundamental science and metrology. You see a clock in the background, that's actually a sundial, which is located uh, within the campus of Ayuka. And what we'll be talking today, to not today, in fact, in four lectures, are not this type of clocks, but the atomic clocks. And uh, sometimes we call them quantum clocks, particularly the optical atomic clock. So you will learn more about those words and things, what exactly those means during these four lectures. And uh, I will be also talking about what are the use of such clocks and so on. So uh, before actually I go into detail, let me just introduce you a basic, very basic uh, plot. Uh, what you see here, it's actually a plot for accuracy of clocks, how that has improved over last 700, 800 years, let's say. So the x-axis is just year, starting from around 1300 to until today, more or less. And the vertical axis, y-axis is saying uh, the duration over which uh, if the clock operates, then it gives one second inaccurate, one second inaccuracy. So what you see like about, let's say 700 years ago, the clocks had one second inaccuracy over one minute time scale. And today what we have the best clock, atomic clock in the world that can operate for 300 billion years. And over that time period, it will be giving just one second inaccuracy. Now, many of you probably, can say, okay, how, how a clock can operate 300 billion years because the age of our universe is only 13.8 billion years. So that's an, like an uh, sort of, it's, it's not a real, it's not a real thing. Okay, there was no clock which can operate for 300 billion years. Supposedly there is a clock which is running for 300 billion years, then it will be accurate to uh, within one second. That's what it means. But the clock is actually a real clock. It's just not operating for 300 billion years. If it could, then it could give only one second inaccuracy. So particularly what we mean by that is like in an extremely precise clocks. So the question certainly comes that why there is a necessity of improving the accuracy of clock to that level. And also the other thing is, what do we do to get such kind of accuracy? And those are the basically things, those I wanted to discuss in these four lectures. And I have divided these four lectures as following. In today's lecture, that is lecture one, I will only give you some introduction to the atomic clocks and their basic principles, and also discuss about the microwave clocks. And uh, next lecture will be on optical atomic clock, which are the most accurate clocks that is available in the world and that sometimes we call it quantum clock because they work uh, on quantum field based on quantum phenomena. The third lecture I will talk about applications of precision timing. There are many sophisticated technology or even the technologies that we use in our daily life. They require very accurate clocks uh, for their working principles. So I'll discuss some of them in the third lecture. And in the last and fourth lecture, I will be discussing about, I will be telling you like uh, uh, using these clocks, particularly the quantum clocks, one can explore fundamental science. So basically these clocks act like a sensor. Well, so the clock is not only for timekeeping, timekeeping is only one application of a clock, but clock can also become sensor what it can sense how, and how we can use them to explore fundamental science in the last lecture. So basically I'm going to cover a broader spectrum 
over these four lectures and expect that you will have an overview and understanding about this entire thing uh, after uh, my four lectures are over. Okay, so let's start today's lecture. So today I'm going to talk to you about the introductions and the basic principles of the clocks in general and also the microwave clocks. So I have divided it into four different things like introduction, basic principle, then room temperature clocks and ultra cold atom clocks. So let's begin. So let us try to understand how a clock works, a simple clock, what we see uh, on the wall of our room or office and etc. So what it has, it has two parts. One is a pendulum, that's a periodic oscillator. It's oscillating periodically, tick, 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 like that. And there is a counter which counts this number of oscillations. Yeah, and that's basically what is there in any clock. It's, it's an atomic clock or a pendulum clock or any type of clock. That's the two most important thing that clock has. Then once you have the count, then you can say, okay, let's say a pendulum has a oscillate, oscillation period of one second. That means one count corresponds to one second. So you can basically convert it into a time and then that is displayed, what you see on the uh, uh, in front of you. Okay, but now how the accuracy comes? So there are two things. One is this oscillator has to be very periodic. So like it's giving one oscillation, let's say over one second, and that second should not change. It's really doing it over one second. If that shifts, then your clock accuracy will be also changed. And that's what makes a clock from accurate to one second over 300 billion years, or a clock that is accurate to one second over one minute. And the other thing is the counter. So you, you have to count really all the counts. If you miss one count, that means you are losing. So we have to have a very reliable count. Okay, so these are the very two basic requirements of a clock, any clock. And these are the two uh, important aspects that a clock should have so that it's more accurate and stable. So the stability comes from the fact that it's very periodic. So one oscillation, today is same as one oscillation uh, after tomorrow or after 1000 years. That gives the stability of, it, of the clock and accuracy is you have to count this number of oscillations very really accurately. That will tell you how accurate you can make the clock. Okay, so now let me tell you briefly about the accuracy and stability. So let's say you have a bow and you have several arrows, let's say 10 arrows and you are throwing them. So what, could be the possible situation. So one situation, as you see uh, on the screen, the second situation could be like that, third could be like that, and fourth could be like that. Now, if I ask you dis discriminate these four situations in, in terms of accuracy and stability, then I would just make a plot, which is like that. So you are throwing 10 arrows, and for the first one, the situation is something like that. So let's say your mean value is this blue and all of your arrows are going very close to the mean value. The second one is it's a little bit scattered from the mean value. The fourth one, it's too much scattered from the mean value. And fifth one is, again, it's not that much scattered, but the mean value has shifted. So this is what it's supposed to be, but that has shifted because all the arrows are here. So now, which one of them are stable and which one of them are accurate? And that's what I have written. The first one is accurate as well as stable. So the mean value is very close to the mean value and it's very stable. The second one is it's accurate because it goes to the mean value, but not that stable because all these things are very much scattered. The third one is neither accurate nor stable. And the fourth one is it's stable, but not accurate because it's shifted. So in any practical, if it is a, any experiment, not even from clock or anything, and also for the clock. So typically it operates uh, following the fourth one. So it's mostly not very accurate, but stable. But then what you have to do, since it is stable, you have to find out what is this offset? What is this difference? And then you have to take it into account in your measurement. And then you have to bring, you have to estimate what is the correct value. Yeah, and these shifts are due to several reasons. These are, uh, let's say, the systematic shifts, what we call. 
that is like due to your instruments and etc i'm not going into details so particularly let's say instruments or environment and etc but if you know how much is this shift because it is stable you can just subtract or add the, that much of value and you can find out what it should be in ideal okay so that's what it means basically accuracy and stability and that's very important factor uh, to understand any precision uh, measurements okay so from the beginning there are different ki kind of clocks that mankind are using one is all we know that like this uh, sand uh, clocks then sundials then even candle clocks water clocks then uh, not few like let's say a few decades back we were using greenwich mean time that was depending on rotation of the earth and one second is just the total one over the rotation period of the earth and rotation period is 24 hours times 60 minute times 60 seconds so if you know exactly what is the if you can measure the exact rotation period then you can basically find out what is the uh, value of one second but even that was not that accurate and then the present scenario is the atomic clocks and at present we have like different type of clocks one is let's say quartz clock that typically we use on our wristwatch and nowadays there are also smart watches this smart smart watches actually connects to the gps clock and it just uh, synchronize the time with respect to the gps clock whereas the quartz clocks have a quartz oscillator and that uh, synchronize to the resonance frequency of that quartz oscillator and maintains the time okay so as i already mentioned you about the quartz clock so let us understand how quartz help us to uh, keep track of let's say time so quartz is just a crystal it has some piezoelectric properties it looks like something like that that you see a crystal and if you open a quartz watch basically you will see this kind of small uh, cylindrical tube it's a very small one and inside of that it has a quartz uh, crystal and if you apply some electric field across it then it resonates you have to also to make it resonate you have to add some uh, capacitance extra capacitance and inductance and you can add them parallelly or in series and then you can get a resonant frequency which is quite accurate but not as accurate as it can be for a uh, atomic clock and that's what the basic principle is of a quartz clock so now let us come back to the atomic clock which is the subject of our interest so the concept of the atomic clock started in 1945 remember that was the time of second world war so during the second world war it basically the, the, it came from the necessity yeah why do we need to go to a better oscillator and then uh uh, uh rabi professor rabi who is a pioneer of the let's say modern atomic physics uh he gave an idea that atoms can be used as an oscillator rather than the quartz or anything else and the basically need was at that time time synchronization at a very far distance was very important that's why microwave communication was also uh, basically came into place at that time and then microwave clocks also came was actually uh, like uh, it was thought of that it could actually be a better oscillator and the necessity was basically uh, to synchronize in different uh, power weapons and all these things uh, missiles and so on but anyhow that's not the point of uh, uh, the subject but the point is why atoms uh, could be a better oscillator because the oscillation frequency let's say in a pendulum it's typically 1 second per oscillation but in case of atoms this oscillation frequency is 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 15 per second so at very fast 10 to the power Uh, for microwave clocks it's around 10 to the power 10 oscillations per second for optical clock it's 10 to the power 15 per second and why it is helpful because let's say you have a counter but anything any counter cannot be perfect always some kind of inaccuracy so in case of a pendulum clock if you miss to miss count one count just one count and if it has a time period of one second that means your inaccuracy directly goes to one second just missing one count on the other hand for a atomic clock where the oscillations are like 10 to the power 15 per second 
there if you miss one count you are basically missing one femtosecond 10 to the power minus 15 second just missing one count so that's how the accuracy becomes much better uh, if you go to higher and higher oscillation frequency so that's the uh, main reason why atoms are much better oscillator compared to any other oscillators second thing is it's very stable you can take in let's say hydrogen atom it's a it has the same property on earth on uh, same property uh, on moon or mars or anywhere the hydrogen atoms are hydrogen atoms so it's a very stable thing but even for a pendulum clock it's not it's i mean if you produce a pendulum today and if you produce pendulum just 5 minutes after two pendulums will have different slightly different in nature because it's man made it's not natural thing so it depends on how do you make this what is the properties maybe length of the uh, pendulum is just a micrometer or little bit different and so on so on so it, it cannot be identical all the pendulums cannot be identical even if you try hard to make them identical that's not possible but for atoms they are like same atoms they have exactly same properties so that's the reason they don't have any aging or anything atom today and hydrogen atom is same has the same property Uh, tomorrow or even after cosmological time scale and etc uh third thing is it's very unperturbed system so energy level of an atom electronic states uh, of of an atom it's very much unperturbed of of course one can say that it can be perturbed by electric field and magnetic field that's true but you can also know exactly how much is the electric field present there and you can calculate how much would be this shift like stark shift or zeeman shift due to the magnetic field it's possible nowadays that you can basically measure electric magnetic fields very very accurately and the corresponding perturbations one can estimate or measure very accurately and then just take it into account in your calculation so basically it's an unperturbed system we can say in that sense and with the invention of lasers it was in 1965 and so, so something like that at that time there are many sophisticated technologies were de developed using lasers and one of them is laser cooling and trapping i will discuss it in more detail during my lecture and as a result of that atoms even single atoms can be cooled to nearly 0 degree kelvin temperature and as a result if you cool them then many of the systematic effects just cancels out like for example doppler shift we know if any particle have a velocity then it experience a doppler shift with respect to the rest frame but this doppler shift will be basically zero if you can cool the atom to 0 degree kelvin temperature or 0 degree zero velocity velocity is zero so doppler shift is zero and it can be trapped in a very small volume let's say uh, within tens of microns volume tens of micron diameter so then you can increase the interaction time with the laser if it is flying away then it's interacting for very small amount of time like microseconds or nanosecond with a particular laser beam which has a certain diameter and so on but you, if you can confine them then basically it interacts forever you can interact for a very long time and that increases your signal to noise ratio so basically what i try to say this laser cooling and trapping this techniques or ion trapping in case of ions that also i will tell you they help to make better and better atomic clock which was not actually realized during 1945 those things were added slowly once the it, it was it was understood that atoms can actually act as a good oscillator and so on then slowly these things these tools and technologies were added and then it became much better and better and better over last several decades okay so first thing what we have to understand the atom photon interaction because atom is an oscillator then how do you measure this or how do you oscillate like let's say we know that uh, electrons are in the valence electron uh, valence band if you have to oscillate that electron you have to excite that electron from valence band to some other other uh, electronic state for that you have to allow i mean sorry you have to add some energy externally and that is typically by a photon it's either microwave photon or a laser of uh, optical photon and uh, so on so basically its principle is same it's just atom photon interaction so for simplicity let us consider a two level state so that's what i am showing here an atom which has two energy levels ground state and excited state <clears throat> so initially the atom was or the electron when i say atom basically electron uh, in that atom is in the ground state then if you supply 
the particular energy to excite that electron particular frequency that means particular energy then this electron will absorb that energy and will go to the excited state and the excited state have some lifetime it will not stay into the excited state forever even if it is a metastable state it also has a lifetime the lifetime is just very long yeah so then after that lifetime it will decay back to the ground state the electron will decay back to its ground state and as a result it will produce a photon due to the energy conversion it has to produce a photon of the same energy and that is called scatter uh, uh, scattering let's say or sometimes we, we call it fluorescence same thing and the scattering rate that means how many photons you can scatter or basically an atom can scatter that can be written by this sort of simple formula so this is the scattering rate this gamma is natural line width of the transition which is uh, if it is a ground state and excited state the natural line width of the excited state basically which is inversely proportional to the lifetime of the excited state tau tau inverse s0 is the saturation parameter which depends on how much energy or basically laser intensity you are supplying from outside s0 is i divided by is i is the intensity of the laser or microwave photons and i is is the saturation intensity so basically s is a saturation parameter which depends on how much energy you are supplying per second per unit area and delta is the detuning like this is the resonant omega 0 is the resonant frequency but you may supply some energy which is slightly lower or above the omega 0 so that detuning is delta which is omega 0 minus omega omega is your supply frequency and the maximum scattering rate one can get is gamma over 2 okay so that's the basic principle which is used for any atom photon experiments also atomic clocks so let's say now the basic principle of atomic clock i told you that it's basically an oscillator and a counter and now let's come back to the atom which is again for simplicity have two energy levels ground state and excited state you are supplying energy and due to atom photon interactions the atom goes to the excited state and after certain time it comes back to the ground state and it produces a fluorescence photon that's what i told you then you measure that fluorescence photon rate scattering rate basically and then what you do you change the frequency of this laser let's say laser beam and then you measure the scattering rate and then you will get some sort of this lorentzian spectrum so when your excitation frequency matches to this uh, ground state to excited state differential uh, frequency then you have the maximum scattering rate your detuning is zero and when you are detuned from that frequency then you, your excitation rate or scattering rate will basically go down that's what you see and the typical spectrum it looks like a lorentzian spectrum or sometimes there are certain type of broadening and etc then it's a void spectrum so let's let that those are more details so let's not going to that then once you measure this kind of spectrum then basically you know what is the center of the spectrum and that exactly matches to your uh, frequency difference between ground state and excited state mm -hmm. so basically you have a measure of that central frequency or the frequency difference between these two states so that's your reference frequency now you know what is your atomic transition frequency you have you know it very accurately and how accurately can you know it that depends on what is the line width of the transition that is delta nu okay so that's basically what you have to do to make an atomic clock you have to measure this spectrum and that you are measuring either by microwave or by optical transitions uh, for lasers for optical transitions okay now if i compare the quartz clock which is not an atomic clock crystal oscillator with other uh, atomic clocks then this is sort of the uh, figure of merit table let's say so the quartz clock can give sort of accuracy 10 to the power minus 9 and stability also on the other uh, on the same order and the quartz is a crystal so it has an aging effect so quartz if you take a crystal today it's not it will it will change its property after some time because it degrades in its quality which is not the case for atom so now if i compare with the atomic clocks like hydrogen measure is 10 to the power minus 13 rubidium clock is 10 to the minus 11 cesium clock is 10 to the power minus 14 so these are all uh, fractional accuracies delta nu by nu cesium fountain which is a cold atom clock 
again in the microwave is 10 to the power minus 16 and optical clocks which are in the optical transitions and also cold atom based these are 10 to better than 10 to the power minus 18 and it has reached basically 10 to the power minus 21 yeah, so I will describe the details of these clocks uh, in uh, to, to, to today's lecture and also next lectures. So don't worry about that thing. So details how they are operates and etc. So today I will be particularly focusing on microwave clocks. So at present the uh, international definition of time, which is known as known as SI unit of time, that's one second, is defined as the oscillation frequency between two hyperfine ground states of cesium atoms. So cesium atom ground state is six s half, and it has two hyperfine levels, like as you see here, and the oscillation frequency is measured up to like uh, uh, less than one hertz accuracy. It's 9192631770. So one second correspond to, corresponds to this many number of oscillations of electrons between two, these two levels. That's the definition of one second based on the atomic clocks. Now cesium atom is actually, it has one valence electron as you see here, and it has a electronic spin is obviously half, and it has a nuclear spin seven half. So this half and seven half, they can parallelly add or opposite, they could be opposite to each other. So as a result, the hyperfine states are uh, seven half plus half, that is four, and seven half minus half, that is three. So it has two hyperfine levels. And the frequency difference between these two levels is measured with extremely great accuracy, which is this value, 9192631770. And the time required for the electron to make this many number of oscillations between these two energy levels of cesium is the definition of one second international. And then there are two types of cesium clocks. One is operates at room temperature that is also known as cesium beam clock that are accurate to fractional accuracy is 10 to the power minus 14. And other one is where the cesium atoms are cooled to nearly zero degree Kelvin, that is called ultra cold cesium clocks. And they are, they have a fractional accuracy, uh, two orders of magnitude better than this beam clock, which has reached to 10 to the power minus 16 level. And I will discuss a little bit more detail about those things. So as I already said that there are two types of cesium clocks. One is atomic beam clock, which operates at room temperature. Another one is at very low temperature, not exactly at zero, but very close to zero, like 30 micro Kelvin which is six orders of magnitude lower than the room temperature. It's like very, 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 very cold. Okay, let, let's see how a cesium beam, beam clock operates. So what happens, as I already described you, the two hyperfine ground states of cesium, and that two states, one can actually consider as two tiny magnets, just oppositely oriented, because the ele electron spins and nuclear spins are opposite to each other. So basically nuclear spin stays, you can consider it like that, and electron spins are added like this or like this. So if it is like this, then this is one state of magnet. If it is like that, then it is other state of magnet. So these two states, just for simplicity, to understand it better, you consider them as a two differently oriented magnets. And what you see here, this is a cesium oven. So it has a lot of cesium atoms, and if you hit them, the cesium atoms will come out of this oven through this small uh, hole orifice. Now inside the oven, the cesium atoms or let's say these tiny magnets have a 50-50 population. So 50% of this type of magnets, 50% of this type of magnets or other way, 50% atoms are in this state, 50% atoms are in that state. Yeah, so if you have both of them here equally probable. Now if you heat them up, they will also come as an equal probable, 50% will be in this state and 50% will be on that state. And that we call atomic beam, cesium atomic beam in this case. So first thing is what you have to do, you have to make a state selection. So you have to select atom which are only at f is equals to three state and remove the atoms which are at f is equals to four state. For that, one have to use, make use of this tan garlic uh, type phenomena. So why do you have to apply a magnetic field gradient? What you see here, a magnetic field gradient, 
and so two different spin states will take two different paths right we know standard lake effect so one let's say goes this direction and other goes in that direction and which goes into this direction they goes out of the experiment and the one which comes in that direction in this straight line let's say which are at f is equals to 3 they go into rest of the experiment <coughs> then what happens we will have a microwave cavity so cesium atoms enters into this microwave cavity in this microwave cavity what do we do we apply microwave to the atoms which are entering to the cavity which are at f is equals to 3 state and then if the microwave is at right frequency these atoms will be excited to f is equals to 4 state and if it is not at the right frequency they will just stay there so now let's say here what happens when we don't apply microwave or the microwave is not at the right frequency they will not change their energy state they will remain into that state and they will just go into the that direction and then there is a second standard lake stage so if we don't do that anything so basically it will just deflect in one some particular direction and they will not fall into the detector the detector is placed in such a way that when we apply the microwave at a correct frequency they will these atoms from f is equals to 3 will be excited to f is equals to 4 state and then they will be deflected into the second standard lake stage in a particular direction so that it falls into the detector and when it falls into the detector your detector will give the count and then we will have a signal then that will tell me okay we are applying microwave at a particular frequency which is this one what we just learned so that way we can basically calibrate the frequency by this entire principle and that's basically how a microwave clock uh, at room temperature works and that's called cesium beam clock because you know this is cesium beam what i told you and etc and that's basically how it looks like it's very compact um it's less a sort of size of a computer cpu and etc a little bit bigger than computer cpu but very compact thing okay and initially it was actually not that compact when people started to make it for example this is a picture what you see it's an nrc canada and it's a very long uh, cesium beam clock same thing and it was kept in a, a completely electronic sealed lab like uh, you see these are basically all coppers so it's like a faraday cage so no outside electromagnetic signals will come into that so it was thought that we need all these things and it was made very long it's like a, a, almost 3 meter long and uh, very prof professionally it was made it's a state of the art technology at that time let's say 2 decades or 3 decades back but now it's very compact it looks like just this one this is a standard commercial cesium clock one can buy commercially Uh, and it's very accurate, accurate to ten to the power minus fourteen, and so on. Just dial some things, and everything works uh, very accurate. Okay, so far so good. Now, how can we improve these things? And okay, I already told you the number because you can improve it by cooling down the cesium atoms' temperature to let's say micro Kelvin temperature. So what happens? What I just explained you, the cesium atoms comes out of the oven. and then it inter it goes into this microwave cavity and interacts twice with the microwave one is in this part and then it freely moves and then it again interacts here in the second part i mean if you remember this one so this is like this is the first interaction and this is the second interaction that's what i mean yeah <clears throat> now if you apply the uncertainty principle then delta t times delta e t is the time and e is the energy we know that has to be greater than or is equals to h bar by 2 h is planck's constant now this delta e can be written as h times delta f f is frequency then you just do little math and then fractional accuracy which is the definition of delta f by f0 f0 is the resonant frequency and delta f is how accurately can you measure that it can be written as 1 over f0 times delta t so delta t in the denominator so delta t is the basically the flying time of the atoms in this no interaction zone from the first interaction to the second interaction somehow if you can increase this delta t 
your fractional accuracies can be much higher now the question is how can you increase delta t of course you can first thing what we can we can do is like we can increase the distance between these two cavities two interaction zones which we'll has take this cavity very longer and then increase delta t but see you cannot do too much because the if you take a very very long uh cavity then it will just fall from this side due to the projectile motions of the atoms it won't go straight it will fall so you cannot make these things and if you know now why they made this uh, initial um, uh, this uh, cesium clocks very long that is exactly because of that reason so they try to make these interaction zones very much far away from each other and that is around let's say uh, One and half meter. So this is the first interaction zone. This is the second interaction zone, and the separation is about one point five meter or so. But you can't do more than that because the atoms will fall down. So the other thing one can do is one can decrease the velocity of the atoms. So if you decrease the velocity of the atoms, then atoms will slowly move to the other part, and it will take longer time. So your delta t will be increased. That is actually much more efficient, and that. was done because laser cooling technique was invented some sort of 1995 and so on nobel prize was given in 1997 <clears throat> on laser cooling so by laser cooling you are basically taking out energy of the atoms and you are cooling them to much lower velocity and you are increasing delta t so as a result what will happen this spectrum will be much narrower yeah and then you can measure its frequency much more accurately okay so that's the beauty of the laser cooling and that was applied and fountain clock or cold atom based uh, microwave clocks were built where there was an improvement by more than two orders of magnitude okay so let us now explain the laser cooling what happens like basically an atom interacts with a laser photons many 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 times and then it loses its energy so you can think of it in such a way like let's say a truck which is a very heavy thing is coming with a certain velocity towards you and you have infinite number of uh, cricket balls and somehow you are managing to throw the cricket balls towards the truck very quickly very frequently not like one by one like what and human can do let's say some in inhuman person is there and he is throwing this balls very 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 fast and then you are transferring momentum and due to this momentum transfer actually you can stop the truck exactly that's the principle what happens here an atom is quite massive compared to photon photons are massless yeah but they carry energy and these photons coming out of a laser have been thrown to the atom very very quickly as a result the atom will be stopped and stopped mean velocity is zero that means temperature is also zero because uh, half mb square is equals to 3 by 2 kvt kinetic energy so temperature and velocity they are interrelated so what happens this already i discussed like in a two level system atom is absorbed by the uh, sorry atom absorbs the photon and it goes to the excited state and the excited state have lifetime so it will decay back to the ground state and it will uh, generate the same photon but these photons could be coming out in any directions it doesn't have any direction in it now if you think of many 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 photons absorptions then the photons are coming out of the laser so they are unidirectional but after scattering this uh, scattered photons are coming out in any directions they don't have any directionality so as a result what will happen a net force so if you integrate these ones the photons which are being scattered they will just be zero average out to be zero then the net force will be coming from the photons which are coming from the laser because they are unidirectional so each photon is carrying momentum let's say uh, h bar times k if there are n photons the net momentum is n times h bar k and then total force after absorbing n photons or force is per second actually depends on how many photons one atom can scatter per second that is scattering rate gamma p times momentum of each photon sorry uh, yeah of um, each photon that is h bar times k 
and the scattering rate I already discussed. So atom photon interaction is the basic for all these atomic clocks and etc. So basically this gamma P is on the order of 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 8. So that means you, one can scatter about 10 million photons per second. And that is actually more than enough to stop an atom which is let's say coming at a velocity of 1000 meter per second. And that is experimentally proven. That's people use, we use it. Yeah, so that's, that's how the laser cooling works. Now let me tell you a little bit more about mathematically about the laser cooling. So what happens, let's consider one atom which has a velocity in a particular direction, let's say in this direction. Now if you apply two counter propagating laser beams, so one laser beam is in this direction, the other laser beam is in this direction. So this atom will experience two different force from these two laser beams because the Doppler shift for these atoms with respect to these photons, which are counter propagating, is different compared to the Doppler shift of the photons in this laser beam because they are co propagating. Doppler shift is minus k dot v. Yeah, so k is in just opposite direction, v is even the same, but it has just a different sign, and that's why this force from this laser beam will be different than force experienced by the for, uh, atom from this laser beam. And that is known as F, uh, just written as F plus and F minus. And if you plot them, that's basically this, that's not going to the detail. And if you now do a little bit more math, basically if you apply these scattering rates and all these things, you know the scattering rate has a detuning. So the effective detuning will have a Doppler shift. And that's why Doppler shift here from F plus has a different sign than Doppler shift from this F sorry, plus and minus. Yeah, so this has two different sign, minus and plus due to the Doppler shift. And then if you add them, do a little bit mathematics, then from these two laser beams, the net force on the atom can be written like that. And the most important thing is basically you can write it as a function of laser intensity. That is a saturation parameter, which depends on laser intensity and detuning, that is delta. Detuning of the laser beam from the resonant frequency of the atom. Yes. So if you choose the detuning correct, like let's say, a detuning could be red detuned or blue detuned. So you can be ab above the resonant frequency or you can be below the resonance frequency. So if you are red detuned light, so delta is negative, then sorry, yeah, then if you if you have a red detuned laser, then basically you can write this total force as minus some constant times velocity of the atoms. And that's a restoring force. Why it is restoring? Because more the velocity, you are more bringing it down, more cooling it down, more force. Yeah, restoring means if it is trying to go away, if you are trying to, the force is trying to bring it back. That's what is restoring. <clears throat> and that is defined by this negative sign. And its force is proportional to the velocity. So if you have a like an atom which is at a larger velocity, you need more scatterings of photons so that you can stop them. And if the atom is at a lower velocity, only fewer photons can be scattered and can be stopped. And that's why the force has a nature, it's proportional to the velocity or magnitude of the velocity. Yeah, so more the velocity, it scatters more photon and it stops much faster. And the Direction of the force, since due to this negative sign, is opposite to the velocity. So force is trying to push it back from moving apart. Yeah. And that is done by the laser cooling by exactly the way I told you. Okay. So now as an example, I am showing you some experimental result. And by the way, that's from my own thesis actually. If you don't do any laser cooling and anything, then velocity distribution of atoms is just a Maxwell's Boltzmann velocity distribution. And that's a measured one, actually measured by me. Okay. Now if you apply the laser cooling techniques, then you can actually destroy this velocity distribution. You can produce more atoms at the lower velocity because you are slowing them down. And this green one, is actually when you slow some of the atoms and produce more at the lower velocity. That's what it means. Now that was what I ex explained to you is only one counter propagating laser beam, but atoms can move in any direction in three dimensions. So that means you need three pairs of counter propagating laser beams to stop the atom from any from 
moving away in any of the directions and these three directions are mutually orthogonal to each other as you see here x y z so this is one pair this is one pair and that is one pair and if you do everything correct and it's not very difficult actually then you can actually <clears throat> stop them at the center of this all three pairs of laser beams in particular to the i mean, I mean it's not that you can by doing this you cannot pull them down to uh, exactly zero temperature because that is limited by in this simple laser cooling it's limited by line width of the transistor or scattering rate and that's called doppler limit td just little bit math and etc and this doppler limit for example for barium atom is 0.44 millikelvin 440 microkelvin so by this simple laser cooling one can cool the atoms to some sort of these values but then there are more sophisticated techniques which i am not uh, discussing because that will extend the talk by cc fast cooling and etc it's a polarization gradient cooling so one can go down to much lower temperature which is the best ones are something sort of 10 nano kelvin temperatures okay anyhow let's not go into that detail okay now we have cooled the atoms but still they can fly away because still they have some sort of velocity which is let's say very low velocity like for example uh, 16 uh, centimeter per second typically the peak velocity in a maxwell's boltzmann distribution of barium atoms are like say 600 meter per second so this peak at 600 meter per second has shifted to <clears throat> 16 sort of uh, centimeter per second so even an orders of magnitude smaller very slow but still it has some residual velocity so that means they, if you don't do anything else, atoms won't stay there forever. They will fly. Up. And for that, you have to do trapping, confinement. You have to confine these atoms. Now you have only slowed them, but not confined. For that, what you one have to do, one have to apply some magnetic field gradient. One have to have a Helmoj, sorry, anti-Helmoj coils. That means the magnetic coils where the electro magnetic fields are opposite to each other and then it will produce this sort of magnetic field profile in space. So at the center, let's say center means x, y, z, zero. This is just our definition. Your magnetic field also goes to zero. Or it's actually defined other way around. Where the magnetic field is zero, that is defined at the center. And then magnetic field, in, sorry, magnetic field increases in magnitude in both directions, but in opposite directions, opposite way. Magnitude is same, but opposite. As a result, what will happen, the energy states of an atom will experience a Zeeman shift due to the magnetic field. And let's say it's again two level system, the ground state has a magnetic moment zero. That means they will not uh, interact with the magnetic uh, field. <coughs> we know the Zeeman shift is G times mu B times uh, mg or mf times magnetic field. If your mf is zero, then uh, shift is zero and that's what is happening in the ground state it, it, it doesn't experience any first order zeeman shift but in the excited state it has two three states three sub levels mf is equals to zero mf is equals to plus one and mf is equals to minus one so they will experience a zeeman shift in this kind of magnetic field gradient so at the center the magnetic field is zero so they all will be uh, degenerate but then as it goes away from the center then mf states will be higher in energy in one direction and lower in energy in the other direction. That's because of the nature of this magnetic field. Magnetic field is has two different signs um, on both sides of the zero, zero field. Then if you again take this red detuned laser, which gives you velocity dependent uh, force, then that laser will be on resonant with, let's say, with with respect to MF is equals to minus state in one side of the magnetic field, one side of the zero, and will be on resonant with MF is equals to plus state on the other side of the zero, right? It's just because of this, uh, this mm -hmm. magnetic field gradient. Then what will happen <clears throat> in this detuning term, you will have an extra term other than this Doppler shift, other than the laser detuning, the extra term is due to the Zeeman shift. And the Zeeman shift will again have a sign, plus or minus, because of the magnetic field's direction, sign of the magnetic field. So 
just simplicity, if you do this math, then basically you will have two parts in the force. One is the velocity dependent force, which gives slowing, and one is spatial dependence of the force. This kappa is a constant. So it's proportional to the z. z is equals to zero is this point, and z increases in this direction, and also its magnitude increases in direction, but with opposite sign. So it's proportional to z. That means if the atom tries to go away from the center, go away from the z is equals to zero, it will experience more force and it will be coming back. So then it's a slowing and trapping. So velocity dependent force is slowing and uh, spatial dependence of the force is trapping. So that's called magneto-optical trapping and it comprises of slowing as well as confinement. Okay, now I have demonstrated all the tools which are laser cooling and trapping so that you can basically <coughs> cool the atoms to nearly zero degree Kelvin temperature and you can also confine them for very long period of time. And long means let's say seconds or a few seconds and so on. And then this is a typical <coughs> like setup, just schematically. These are all three counter propagating laser beams. And then atoms are coming out at a, of an oven and these are the magnetic field and they will be confined and trapped here. And this is the actual picture. This is the experimental picture. It's again from my thesis actually. So these are barium atoms, about 1 <clears throat> billion barium atoms are trapped here. This green blob, what you see, these are fluorescence coming out of those uh, 1 billion barium atoms. And if you take a spectra, that's how it looks like. It can be seen actually by bare eyes. Now, why it is important? Why this laser cooling and trapping is important? Because one can basically make a very small dense sample. The interaction time will increase. Many systematic shapes will be decreased. And it can be trapped in a very well characterized environment. That can allow you to do a very precision experiment like clock. So these are the tools which are used and which improves the accuracy of the clocks from a normal room temperature clock. Okay, now I have already introduced you the laser cooling and trapping things and that's what actually I'm showing and I'm trying to demonstrate you over uh, using some uh, animations how a fountain works. So in a fountain, the first stage of the fountain is by this magneto-optical trapping, you collect a lot of cesium atoms in a magneto-optical trap and then you throw them up upwards and then there is a microwave cavity in between. So when the atoms are going through the microwave cavity, it interacts, then it's again falling down due to the gravity and it comes through the same microwave cavity and it interacts again with the microwave. So then it's basically two interactions. If you remember with the cesium beam clock, there was also two interaction zones. And basically we started with the idea that we have to increase the time between these two interactions. And that's why we laser cool. So here, when atom goes upwards, it interacts once, then it goes and reaches to certain heights and then falls back and then interacts second times. <clears throat> and the time between these two interactions is quite larger compared to a beam clock. Yeah. And then you basically do the detection. Okay, so let me just keep these things basically. So this is what is, uh, there is another thing called Rabi frequency, but that's just probability of how the atoms can be in the ground state and excited state. And now let me explain uh, how this helps, this entire laser cooling and trapping helps to make this resonance frequency 9192, uh, uh, sorry, I also forgot, 9192 uh, this frequency at a much accurate, with, with much accuracy. So let's, let us discuss this in terms of block sphere. Yeah, so cesium atoms have a magnetic moment and that can be oriented in a particular direction and that orientation can be changed. And if you look into the all possibilities, that's called block sphere. That can be uh, represented on any point of the surface of this block sphere. So now let's say over this first interaction, the atoms, uh, the, the microwave photons which you uh, apply for exciting these cesium atoms are just ended at this point. Then the cesium atoms will have this magnetic moment, will interact with this microwave, and then they will acquire a certain phase where this microwave, uh, which are same as the phase of the microwave. So this will be placed at a certain point on the block sphere. 
So after this interaction, they will preserve this phase and then they will just do a free evaluation. They will preserve that phase because they are coherent. And then during the second interaction, the microwave is in a different phase. Microwave also propagates and microwave will appear at a different phase. And as a result of this phase difference, so this phi one and phi two are different. As a result of that, it will interfere. You know that interference basically happens due to the phase difference and that's represented by the blocks here. So these atoms will basically interfere and then what happens during this uh, entire Doppler profile, which is due to the velocity of the atoms, that will have an interference range in between. So that will be basically split into multiple, like several, several of them smaller uh, pieces. And if you zoom them up, they look like these things, like a very tiny one of these, two of these fringes basically, it looks like that. So instead of this entire broad, Dop sorry, entire broad Doppler profile, you will be able to measure the frequency at a much, much accuracy level, like something like less than one hertz. So you are measuring this 91926317770 at a accuracy of less than one hertz, sub hertz. And that's the basic reason why this uh, cooling and trapping helps to improve the accuracy of microwave. So I hope I am able to tell you how it helps. And just to give you the, this is uh, like, uh, there are several cesium fountain clocks operates at this moment in the entire world. <clears throat> and the best ones are like in NPL UK, then NIST in USA, Sierta in Frady, uh, France, uh, Italy, Germany, and Japan. So this is, for example, one typical setup of cesium fountain clock. This is from uh, Switzerland, Metas. So this is the fountain where you have this is this is the portion where uh, atoms are trapped in the magnet optical trap and they are thrown upwards to this uh, microwave chamber and so on. This is the necessary optics that is required for the laser cooling and trapping. And this is the rest of them are electronics, which is required for an experiment. It's a fairly complex experiment, but not, I mean, it's doable. So uh, in India also at CSI and NPL uh, uh, developed one of the cesium clocks, which probably at present is not operating. They have some maintenance issue and so on. So they are trying to operate them again. So if I <clears throat> just plot the accuracy of the cesium clocks that how it improved over last several years. So you see the, this is this, this green, green, green uh, dots and the best cesium clock is at uh, NIST USA, which is 1.1 times 10 to the power minus 16 fractional accuracy. And the cesium clock at CSI and NPL from their 2015 data, this is about one order of magnitude uh, lower compared to the best one. So it's around 10 to the power minus 15 or so. That's what they uh, published in 2015, which is actually quite good, in fact. Okay, so I would stop my first lecture here. Uh, now, if there are questions, I would be able to, I'll be happy to, uh, I will say, happy to answer them as much as I can. So can you please raise your hand? Yeah, so let me unmute. Uh, Hi, Mahinder Arori. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, what are the uh, what are the main uh, applications in astronomy uh, using laser cooling, sir? No, you mean main applications of astronomy for laser cooling or clock? Laser uh, cooling principle, sir. No, no, no. Laser cooling is a technique by which one produces atomic clock and the atomic clock have a lot of applications in astronomy. Yeah. Okay. So, you see, my lecture is on atomic clock and laser cooling is a technique which is used to produce atomic clock. So, atomic clock have a lot of, uh, like, uh, uh, for example, applications in astronomy. Just to give you one example, you know VLBI, very large baseline array. So, there are a lot of radio telescopes around the world and they need to be phase synchronized. And this phase synchronization yes, comes. Yes, sir. I heard uh, this laser cooling application is used in uh, uh, 
Sorry, your voice is breaking. I am not able to hear you. I am not able to hear you. Mohinder, your voice is breaking. I am not able to hear you. Some some shot of internet signals are here. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Can you please type? Can you? Please? I am not able to hear. Mohinder. Sure, sir. Sure, I can, sir. Okay, next is uh, Vinisha Kalwani. Uh, let let me. Yes, yeah. Sir, I wanted to ask, what is the reason for the name fountain in the full replay system? What is the sorry? Repeat. So the reason for the name fountain. What does that uh, signify? Oh, fountain is just like a water fountain. In the water fountain, you know that at uh, like. Uh, uh, Like water molecules go up, goes upwards and falls down. See the same thing happens here. Atoms goes out upwards and then falls down. So it looks like a fountain. So that's why the name called uh, the name came atomic fountain. Uh, so, so the light from the same atoms, but at different times, is interfering with each other. Light not from the atoms. Lights are external. lights are coming from laser beams and these are given externally to interact with the atoms lights are not coming from the atoms lights are given to the atoms okay, yeah okay then uh, shlok saha uh, hello sir good afternoon yeah. uh, sir can you again explain why the uh, Uh, time between the two interactions be increased. Ah, okay. So let me go back. Yeah. So you understand? I think these two interaction zones, like interaction one, interaction yes, two, and then there is a free, freely evolving time that is delta t. So now, if you apply uncertainty principle, delta t, delta e, delta e is the energy. Energy is nothing but frequency of the transitions. So energy you can write as in terms of Planck's constant by delta f. F delta f is the line width of the transition. And then you take delta t as a denominator. And then basically, the accuracy of a clock is typically written as delta f by f zero. F zero is the resonant frequency. That is the centroid. Of the spectrum and delta f is the full width half maxima, let's say, of that transition. So delta f and f by f zero, as it is lower, it is more accurate clock. That is called fractional accuracy. So there, if you apply this formula, it will come to one over f zero times delta t. So if you increase delta t, that means time between two interactions, then your fractional accuracy of the clock will be better. and that's what you want right yes sir thank you so and, much yeah and then delta t you are increasing by pulling them down so that it takes longer time to reach from one to the other understood yeah <clears throat> then uh, samaskaran sorry uh, sa yeah sankas sankarsan yes sir uh, according to general theory of relativity mm -hmm. if uh, we use atomic clocks and uh, we travel through space still the uh, atomic clocks are not that accurate and get dilated yeah so can you explain about it why does that happen yeah see basically this is like uh, just take a simple example like let's say if you have a clock on the earth surface and if you take this clock at a little bit high this clock tick rates will be different Like it's a gravitational wave shift. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and the reason it changes because of the gravitational wave shift. So that can be also the same principle can be used also to test this uh, what you said general theory of relativity and etc. But at this moment, clocks are not accurate enough to do that thing. I mean, there are two things. One thing is I just gave you an example like this height change, but another thing is general relativity, which I understand. So at this moment, for example, the base atomic clock can measure a height difference of one millimeter. So just a clock here and another clock just one millimeter above the 
tick rates of these two clocks will be different and that people have measured. That is just a publication in February 2022, two months back. But it's not accurate enough to measure all the other aspects of the general theory of relativity. That's why people are trying to make better and better clocks. Okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, and then Akshat Pati. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, my question is that why instead of hydrogen or any other simple atom, the transition of the transitions of cesium atoms were chosen to define the SI unit of time? Uh -huh, right, right. That's it. Yeah. So the reason is cesium has only one stable isotope, that is cesium 133. See, the clock itself has a principally is very complicated. So if you take cesium atom, then you don't even need to do any isotope selection. If you took any other atom, then first actually you have to do an isotope selection because from one isotope to isotope to the other isotope, the energy level differences are different, which is called isotope shift. In cesium, you get it for free because there is only one stable isotope. That's the reason it came, I mean, it was defined with respect to the cesium atoms. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Pushti Srimakar, Sri Srimankar. So, sir, sir, my question is that as you told about laser pulling of barium, so is there any specific reason to choose a barium atom? Yeah. See, the laser cooling, I wanted to basically tell you the principle how the laser cooling works. Now, why did I choose barium? Because then I don't need to download pictures from the internet. That just comes from my own PhD thesis. Yeah, that's the reason I explained with barium atoms, but principally it's same for any other. If you take any atom, cesium, rubidium, etc., the basic principle of laser cooling is identical. The only reason I choose barium because it's, <laughs> this, 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 that was my own PhD thesis, but nothing other, otherwise no other special. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Then Spandan Joshi. Hello, sir. Yeah. My question is, sir, why, why are the oscillations set to that very specific number to define one second? Not more uh, than your, your, either. Your, your voice is breaking. I'm not able to hear properly. Sir, may I type the question? Uh, yeah, maybe you can type the question. So then we can go to Opora. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, you were just telling about the uh, physical significance which is used. Uh, these atomic clocks are used in astrophysical uh, area, uh, some, somewhere in radio uh, telescopes. So how they are used means? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, are you aware of VLBI, very large baseline array? Or let's say even if you are not aware of, aware of VLBI, uh, do you know that this uh, GM, GMRT have 30 uh, radio antennas which are around in few... Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so there are several yes. 30 antennas. Yes. Now, all these 30 antennas are looking into the space and they are detecting data separately, individually, right? Now, how do you correlate the data in time frame? that this data from one, one uh, disk is same as, uh, I mean, at the same time, the other disk is look, looking. It's just for synchronization, you synchronizing yeah, all Exactly. The so you have to basically synchronize this, all these disks in time. And actually what people do, instead of that, they also synchronize in phase. So for this time and frequency synchronization, People need a very good accurate atomic clock and at present GMRT use a hydrogen measure. The, and uh, maybe I can tell you in next lectures, not next one, next to next one, that they have improved quite a bit and they call it advanced GMRT by going from a simple clock to a hydrogen measure clock and it can be further improved if they go to a much better clock, like optical clock, let's say. In fact, many of the international such uh, facilities, they use optical clock at present, not GMRT, but maybe in the future they will use. Okay, so this was one example why atomic clock are important for astronomy, but that's not all. Actually, I will tell you in my last lecture that see, fundamentally by doing astronomy or by atomic physics or by any physics, we are looking into, we are trying to understand our physics, our science. And 
the same there are same science questions which can be looked through astronomy as well as can be looked through nuclear physics and at, uh, and atomic physics and these answers should match the answers are scientific answers they should not be dependent on whether it is coming from astronomy or from atomic physics for example looking into there is an open question whether fundamental constants like fine structure constants or electron to proton mass ratio these constants are really constants or they are changing over cosmic time since since the beginning of the universe and they can be looked at from astronomy like quasar absorption spectra they can be also looked at from atomic clock comparison so these are another main reason why people want to do atomic clocks because atomic clock gives much accurate answer compared to the quasar absorption spectra however both of them are important because it you need to test from different things to really make sure that your answer is correct and not and that i will cover in my fourth lecture okay. thank you sir in detail yeah so there are some uh, this google doc question so let me take uh, i would so this is what ritika solanki i would like to know that what is the reason behind that the electron and the nuclear pin spins are opposite to each other that is just simple uh, ls coupling and uh, rules so how they are uh, coupled this is standard like uh, textbook thing okay there is another one is jivakula anudip so he is asking do the laser beams have to hit the atoms head atoms head on the on to cool them is if so what is the probability that the cross section of the atoms and the laser beams actually allow this so it's actually not the laser beams laser beams are carrying photons photons are massless and their dimensions are much much like infinitely smaller compared to the dimensions of the atoms and the collisions are actually not head on collisions these are not classical things <clears throat> so you know there is a, this uh, what is this parameter called sorry i am also impact parameter so not necessarily they have to have an head on collision yeah so it's just an absorption so uh, it's not really collision okay then there are few more questions um, so apora do you have another question you already asked one right if not then subodhi yes, yes 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 sorry i am yeah subodhi dotto hello sir yeah sir uh, is there any chance that uh, atomic clock uh, can affect by a strong uh, gravi gravitational field or strong magnetic or electric field uh, atomic clock what can measure can affect uh, man uh, yeah. it can be slow or uh, it can be fast by strong uh, gravitational field or strong magnetic field in the presence yes, of yes right right so electric and magnetic field is yeah i mean present atomic clocks are accurate enough to uh, measure any electric field change or magnetic field change that simple that people have i mean it's already the present accuracy is good and much much better than whatever you need now strong gravity field that is a good question that is actually should happen but as i somebody was asking about this uh, uh, general theory of relativity so basically it goes to the same direction so improvement of the atomic clock uh, clock accuracy will actually be able to measure that thing and that's why we called atomic clock as a quantum sensor <clears throat> yeah so <clears throat> yes your i mean to answer your question is yes it can measure but the present level of accuracy won't be able to do that there are other new technologies which are under investigation to make a better atomic clock which probably i will not cover during my lecture it's called nuclear clock so instead of electronic transitions it will be based on nuclear transitions and there one can actually expect few orders of magnitude better in terms of accuracy and maybe <clears throat> they can measure uh, this kind of things in the future so your I mean, answer to your question is yes i hope okay. i am able to, yeah so then uh, khushi lalit Sir, uh, can you only use instead of atoms to make a clock? Sorry, your voice is. I am not. Can you repeat? Sir, can we small instead of atoms making? No, Kushi. Sorry, you can you type it, please. I am not able to hear. Ah, uh, okay. Then Mohammad Rehan. Hello, sir. Yeah. 
sir as i say some atoms have accuracy and stability are same but say, some are different but why sorry sorry some atoms have stability and accuracy are same but some are different like quartz has accuracy and stability are same no 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 that's just a number so it's 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 just like you are talking about that table so that's just a number it's uh, like uh, that's the situation where it is same but not necessarily it has to be same so the accuracy is like how accurately you are measuring that frequency and stability has a time factor how long is that number stable yeah so they they should not be same numbers it's just a coincidence that that same for uh, quartz okay so you see yeah yeah you have another so, question yes sir yeah. sir excentration in barium why are we consider oh that answer i already gave you see i used barium as an example to 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 uh, describe the laser cooling and trapping technique the laser cooling and trapping technique is same for barium rubidium cesium whatever atom you take it's just the laser frequencies are different otherwise the technically it's same thing now the reason i took barium because i then i don't need to download pictures from internet but i can use the pictures from my own thesis i hope i, I am able to answer you okay sir yeah but the techniques i want to main reason was to tell you the techniques and the techniques are same okay so khushi now i can read your question can you use molecules instead of atoms for making drug that's a very good point actually and the answer is yes <clears throat> so as i told you about nuclear clock people are also trying to make other type of clocks which are molecular clock and highly charged ion clocks so ions which are basically have a bare nucleus and which few electrons outside highly charged ions so those probably can make better clocks but there are issues for example you have to have a molecule which can be cooled molecules have several rotational and vibrational states so energy levels are very complicated so it's very difficult to find out a laser cooling scheme actually i was skipping all those details little bit but just to give you an answer for laser cooling you have to know availability of the laser frequencies and you have to have a simple scheme which can be laser cooled and for molecules these are very complicated however there are certain molecules which actually can be laser cooled and people are trying to do that so answer to your question is yes basically people are working on that but at this moment there is no working molecular clock in future there will be. there is another question from spandan joshi sir why is the number of oscillation fixed to this one so this is the atomic property <clears throat> for cesium atoms this is the frequency difference between two hyperfine ground states so this is an atomic property of cesium and that's what is internationally considered as the standard okay so i do not see any other questions are there further otherwise my next lecture is on friday okay then thank you for attending